What does GSD stand for? Get Shit Done Venture Studios. Oh, okay. Hey, so anyhow, uh, audience, it's great to have you on board today. My name is Gary Fowler, and I am the CEO, co-founder of GSD Venture Studios. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce the one, the only, Guy Kawasaki. I mean, it's his uh, author, 15 books. I don't know if there's any additional books coming, Guy. Uh, nope. <laughs> venture capitalist, uh, influencer, 10 million social followers. And, um, you know, Guy, before we get started, I want to tell you, have you had a dramatic impact on my life and helped me a great deal? So when we met in 2013, and you were gracious enough to come on stage at Skokova School of Management, there was a person sitting right in the middle of the audience there. His name is David Yang, and he's one of the most successful entrepreneurs, technology guys, Armenian, Chinese. And he was sitting in that audience, and he came up to me, and he said, would you get have Guy Kawasaki please sign my book? And I mean, I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't really <laughs> know the guy. I didn't have a personal relationship. I brought him over to you, and you signed his book and took a picture. Fast forward, guy, three years later, I'm walking down university in Palo Alto, and he's a billionaire. He comes up to me and he says, I need to see a CEO and co-founder. I'm forming a new company, a new AI company. Do you know anybody that's be interested? Well, three days later, I had a conversation. I became the co-founder and CEO of the company. One of the top 10 AI HR tech companies on the planet today, it's called Eva. And if it wasn't for your kindness that day, and by the way, uh, you know, at the same time, my father had gotten sick, so I had to come back over to the state. So it was serendipity. But your kindness that one day of taking that picture and allowing him to have an autograph changed my entire life. So, I mean, I, got, I talk about gratitude. I want to thank you for that because it really impacted me. Well, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm glad that such a little thing had such impact in your life. Yeah, thank you. So, Guy, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know we, we you know, sure. I've heard your story many times. It's incredible. If you can tell mm -hmm. the honest, that would be great. So, bottom line is, uh, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I was born in 1954. Uh, I left Hawaii to go to college. And in college, I met someone who gave me a job at Apple. So, I was Apple's second software evangelist. My job was to convince people to write Mac software and create Mac hardware. I did that for a few years. I left to start a company. Then I returned to Apple as Apple as an Apple fellow and chief evangelist. Then I left that. And now I am uh, the chief evangelist of Canva, an online graphics design service out of Sydney, Australia. I am also... <laughs> <laughs> I'm an adjunct professor uh, for University of New South Wales. I'm an executive fellow for the Haas School of Business, and I'm the creator of the Remarkable People podcast, which is where I put most of my effort today. That's uh, amazing. You know, you have, so I read your book, Wise Guy, and I got to tell you, it was like the secret. I, it was, for me, it, it was um, revealed a lot. And there were a couple parts that were really incredible for me. And one of the things you talk about, uh, English teacher you had, I think his name was Keebler. And you uh, talked about being Keebits. You said he was a hard Keebles. ass from you? <laughs> yes. And I mean, and, and you talk about life. And can you talk about that? was incredible, actually. Well, yeah. So uh, my insight, uh, and you know, believe me, I was in high school f 40 years ago. So my ins more, actually. So my insight was that as I look back, the teacher that was the hardest probably taught me the most and I think that when you're in school or in a job you're always looking for the easiest teacher the easiest boss but if you have 20 years of hindsight you can look back and say wow the tough teacher taught me this the tough boss taught me this and so Harold Keeble was a very tough teacher and Steve Jobs was a very tough boss <laughs> and so I've had the benefit of both now, at the time, I can't tell you that it was, you know, uh, pixie dust and unicorns. But now, looking back, uh, I owe a great debt to both of them. Now, it's amazing. And you talk about, um, there was a part I read there that said, sell yourself, trust, and prove yourself. And I remember those part of the wisdom. 
you know, selling yourself, you say it's always about selling yourself, right? At some level, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I kind of think that at any given point, you know, it, it people are always uh, making judgments about you. And, and that never ends. And uh, I don't mean to say that, you know, you're always on a stage, but you kind of are always on a stage. And so, you know, you never know when you're, you're reaming some waiter or waitress out and you think you're like, you know, the big dog on the porch. Somebody in that restaurant is watching you thinking, what an asshole. You know, <laughs> I'd never hire that guy. Uh, I, I think it really works like that. When you talk about, you know, this interesting part, you talk about um, the founder of Salesforce, actually, yeah. you gave him a job and you talk about your son and, and it's just, you know, it's because sometimes when you have somebody that's an intern or they come in, you know, sometimes you give them the dirty work and you don't have a relationship. Yeah. But I mean, could you talk about that story? That's just incredible. Yeah. So I, I gave Mark Benioff his first job. He was a freshman at USC. He got a summer job working in the Mac division uh, in my department, writing assembly language sample programs. And you know, Mark Benioff has become the man, right? So he's the founder of Salesforce. And as a matter of fact, for my podcast, I'm interviewing him this week. So uh, yeah, so you know, I didn't obviously I didn't think much of it. And then fast forward, he's he's Mark Benioff, the Mark Benioff. But he has never forgotten that. And so he has helped me and, you know, agreed to do a podcast, which, you know, a lot of CEOs turned me down. And you said he helped your son and then somebody yes. else he helped also. Uh, he, helped, he helped my son and he helped the person who was the first software evangelist, Mike Boich. Uh, his son wanted to work for Salesforce also. So he helped both our sons. And uh, let's just say that there are a lot of billionaires who probably – would not have done that. Let's just say, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wrote him. He was my, uh, in Teak, my fraternity, and I wrote yeah. him. And uh, actually, I got a response. I would say no less than an hour or no more than an hour later. And yeah. uh, somebody called me up from their corporate development folks. And I mean, it started the ball. It was unbelievable. It's uh, yeah. very kind, actually. So you were work for a jewelry store. So you went to Stanford yeah. University, uh, <laughs> you started law school and then quit. And we'll go, go into that a little bit. But you work for a jewelry store with diamonds and you talk about lessons learned about relationships. Can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Well, actually, it was a jewelry manufacturer. And so we sold to stores as opposed to sold to the actual customer, the, the final customer. And uh, that was a great experience because I learned how to sell uh, the jewelry business is a real no BS business, right? And it's at some level, it's valuable commodities, but it's all commodities. I mean, you know, you can check the price of gold all day long. I mean, you know, it's a spot price and you can check the price of diamonds. So you can literally throw things on a scale and figure out how much gold is there and how big is the diamond. And so this is the raw material cost. It's, you know, it's, it's not some secret formula. And so that, that's the low side, right? So the toughest buyer will want to pay you, I don't know, 5% over the value of melting your ring. Mm -hmm. And and it becomes a very tough business uh, built on trust and relationships. So it really taught me how to sell. And that skill has been valuable for the rest of my life. I am glad that I learned how to sell hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and, you know, back then it literally was. I mean, you you – you flew into a city, you opened up your bag on a counter, and you prayed for an order. Um, today, you know, you're doing like A-B testing on your homepage, and does the blue link work better than the red link? And, you know, should the background be light or dark? And, you know, how should we optimize for Instagram and Facebook? But that's not hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's like data analytics. It was a whole different world. And you said there was something interesting. You went back for an engagement ring. Yeah. And about the diamond story and trust. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, years after I left the, uh, the diamond business or the jewelry business, um, I contacted a former very good customer of our company. Uh, this is in Kansas City. There's a jeweler called Tivol, T-I-V-O-L. And so I reached out to Tivol. I said, listen, I'm getting married. Um, can I buy a diamond? And so, you know, after years after working in the jewelry business, they just sent me a package with, I don't know, probably $30,000, $40,000 worth of diamonds. 
And they said, here, pick one and we'll give you a deal. And, you know, it was, it was like that. Um, I don't know. That would be like, you know, you, you, you call up a Porsche dealer or Mercedes dealer and say, you know, I'm thinking of buying a car and they send some over for you. I mean, you know, not, you know, because five years ago you knew them. I mean, Oh, that actually might happen at a Porsche or Mercedes dealer. <laughs> well, it happens with Mercedes, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm no longer a Mercedes brand ambassador. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, 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 the world's an oyster right now. <laughs> so, so, you know, that teaches trust, right? I mean, so they obviously trusted you to get diamonds like that just coming yeah. in. I remember from your book, I mean, it's, it's uh, incredible. And then there was another part that would <laughs> fascinated me. You said... You went on to someone's house and uh, to help her with her uh, Mac, and you yeah. have to see <laughs> in the right hand corner. <laughs> okay, this is a this is a really good story. Okay, so you know when you, you talk to many famous successful people, and, and they and you ask them, so what motivated you? And they'll say, well, I wanted to foster education. I wanted to reduce the digital divide. I wanted to make uh, I wanted to improve the human condition and health and welfare and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, so in my book, I am completely honest and I, I tell some stories about what motivated me. And let's just say it wasn't world health. I mean, it wasn't like Sandra Bullock in that, that movie where she's Miss Congeniality. You know, it wasn't like that. So one day. When I was working for Apple, uh, Sandra Kurtzig, who was the founder of Ask, which was a humongous enterprise software success back in the day. And so she was having trouble with her Mac. So I went to her house to help her, you know, debug her Mac. And for one thing, she owned the Ferrari F40 or something or a boxer or something. So, you know, just for that, I would go. So anyway, so I go to her house. And she opens up her, her, she turns on her Macintosh, and the window that's front and center is Quicken. And so I'm a Quicken user. I know exactly where the balance is. So I looked down at the balance, and she has like a quarter million bucks in her in her checking account. I said, freaking A, I mean, that is the goal in life. You have quarter million bucks in your checking account? I mean, you know, most people's including mine, I mean, at any given point, your checking account is either overdrawn or not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I saw this. I said, this is a different world. I got to get into this world where I can have six digits in my checking account. So that's as, you see, that's how superficial a person I am. <laughs> and, and you talked about, too, about growing up and, and uh, you know, on the other side of the tracks in terms of motivation. So there's yeah. Two, you know, two sides of it, right? So you saw one on that side. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, you, you mean the other motivating factors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, now I, I don't want to paint a picture of, you know, true Horatio Algier. I got off a boat in New York with just my suitcase and, you know, $5 in my pocket and I made myself a success. Okay. So I came from a lower middle class family in Hawaii tough part of Hawaii. But, you know, I didn't know I was poor. It's not like we were suffering. My, my parents didn't make a lot of money, but it's not like I ever went hungry. Okay. So the, the, I don't want my, my life is not going to be made into a movie. Okay. No bullshit. I, I'm not going to try to, you know, reinvent my history and not talk about the bone spurs and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So with that caveat, so um, I used to catch the the bus to and from high school and twice I got hijacked on the bus or at a bus stop. So I got robbed twice and, you know, I don't know for 75 cents or something. And it's not like I was robbed and beaten and, you know, pulled the gun or anything. I was just you know, bigger guy said, give me your money. So at that point I said, you know what? I, I am going to work hard and I am not going to live in some place where I get hijacked. So that was number one. And then number two, um, in high school, I don't know how this worked out, but somebody, somebody's father or something gave me a ride in his 911, Porsche 911. And I got a ride in that 911. I said, this is what it's all about. That was a life-changing moment. Now, fast forward four or five more years, 
my roommate in college came from a very wealthy family, a big coal mining family out of Ohio. And they used to live in Phoenix most of the year. So one I don't know, Thanksgiving or something, I go home with him and his father picks us up in a Rolls Royce. So already my head is exploding, right? Like the best car, I mean, you know, a Rolls Royce. And let's put it mildly, I'd never been in a Rolls Royce before. And we go to his house and his house, the backyard of his house is the Arizona Biltmore Golf Course. So my head is doubly exploding. Then we go out to dinner. And we go in two separate cars, and his mom was tired after dinner, so she asked me to drive her home. And she had a Ferrari Daytona. So I got to drive a Ferrari Daytona, and I said, this is also where it's at. So, you know, when everybody's trying to get world peace and end poverty and all that, I'll tell you, man, I just, I didn't want to get robbed, and I wanted a Porsche or a Ferrari, and that motivated me. And that's the God's honest truth, and... Yes, it's it's shallow, it's insipid, it's plastic, it's blah blah blah. But that is that God's honest truth. That's what motivated me. And then when uh, when we were in <laughs> Russia, you told a story about going down El Camino Real and Jackie. Chan. Oh, okay, okay, this is not man. Oh my God, are you stalking me? I mean, you really have a great memory. So. Um, <laughs> I read your book. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Jeez, you, you know it better than I do. You should give my speeches for me. Okay, so one day. Well, first, first, I have to tell you this story about this story, okay? So I told this story once in a in a in an internal employee meeting for a large software company. And when I told this story, there were a handful of people, and this is, you know, within the last six months, who complained bitterly that this story objectified women. So I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to tell you that before I tell you the story, because okay. to this moment, I still don't know how it objectified women. Okay. So here's the story. So this is, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and I had a Porsche 911. And I stop at this stoplight in El Cam on El Camino Real in Menlo Park. And I look over to my left. And there's this car with four teenage girls. And they're looking at me. They're smiling. They're making eye contact. They're giggling in the whole shooting match. So I'm thinking, oh, clearly I've arrived. They know me from Apple. They know me from my books. They know me from my dot-com company. You know, I am like, I have arrived. Even teenage girls know who I am. So the girl in the front seat goes, you know, roll down your window. So I roll down my window. She sticks her head out and she says to me, are you Jackie Chan? <laughs> and that was just the freaking funniest moment of my life. And and. And so, so that's, you know, a good, funny story. But the, I think the moral of that story is now one of my goals in life, going back to how shallow and insipid and plastic I am, one of my goals in life is that someday Jackie Chan is in Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong or wherever the hell he lives, and he's driving his Bentley or S-Class or, you know, Porsche, and he pulls up to a stoplight. And he sees this car full of girls, and they're making eye contact with him. And, you know, girl in the front seat tells Jackie, roll down your window. He rolls down the window, and the girl leans out and says, are you Guy Kawasaki? <laughs> that is one of my goals in life. Now, I, I caught heat from this company because that is objectifying, they think, or some people thought, teenage girls. And I... I do you find that distasteful? I mean, I this is literally I mean, the true story. I'm telling you. It is what it is. <laughs> We're just talking I don't know. the facts. It is what it is. All right. Yeah. So I don't know. But your dad also, I understand. So your dad came to San Francisco. Oh, another great story. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So so one day. Uh, my wife and I, we were living in San Francisco on Union Street, right where Union Street dead ends into the Presidio. So that's just a nice part of San Francisco, okay? So I'm outside, and I'm cutting the Bougainvillea hedge. And this old white woman, older white woman, comes up to me and says, do you do lawns, too? <laughs> <laughs> and I say to her, oh, I'm Japanese, so you think I'm the yard man, right? She goes, no, 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 you're just doing a great job. I want to know if you do lawns. So that's a good story right there, right? You know, like 
don't assume anything. Okay. Yeah, the, the guy you think is the yard man, he could be the owner of the house, right? So that that's a good moral in and of itself. But that's not the, the best part of this story. A few weeks later, my father comes to San Francisco. I'm third generation Japanese American. Obviously, that makes him second generation. So I figure he is, I'm going to tell him this story. I figure he is going to freaking go off, right? Like, how dare this woman ask my son if I'm the yard man? He went to Stanford. He worked for Apple. He's written, I don't know, at that point, I don't know, six, seven books. You know, like, what is with these white people? They always assume Japanese people are gardeners. And to my utter amazement, he says to me, you know, son, where you live on Union Street in San Francisco, a Japanese man cutting the hedge, statistically, she was right. You probably were the yard man. So get over it. <laughs> and I tell you, I kid you not, that was a pivotal moment in my life because at that point I said, you know what? He was basically telling me to man up, don't be so sensitive, don't look for problems. You know, deflect that kind of stuff with humor. Don't go through your life angry. So that was a major moment in my life. And you talk about also, I mean, it's great. Yeah, I mean, it's I love it. I love these humbling. It's amazing. Your book is incredible, by the way. You talk about it's quitting is okay. And you yeah. talk about UC Davis and, and uh, law school. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, another story. So uh, I went to Stanford. And after Stanford, uh, I, now you have to understand, this is in 1976. So in 1976, if you're Asian American, and maybe still today, your parents want you to be doctor, lawyer, or dentist, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the three you know, kind of prestigious, safe professions. So when I was an undergrad at Stanford, I took a pre-med class. And it was walking rounds in the Stanford Hospital. And on the first class, walking through Stanford Hospital, I fainted. So I said, okay, I'm not cut out to be a doctor. Then I thought, you know, do you want to oh, spend your whole life? I didn't yeah. read that in the book. About yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so the next thing I say, so, you know, do I want to stick my hand in people's mouths for the rest of my life? That elim eliminated dentistry. So what was left? Law. Now, my father was a state senator in Hawaii, and he, he only went through high school. He never went to college. Mm -hmm. So it was his dream that his son go to college and go to law school and be a lawyer. So I went to law school at UC Davis, and I lasted only two weeks. I mean, I just could not stand law school. that They just rip you all the time, and, you know, it's all about intimidation, like that movie Paper Chase. And so I quit, and for sure I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to be disowned, you know. Suicide is the only uh, only out here. And my father says to me, you know, son, it's okay. You can quit. Just make something of your life. We don't care if you quit law school. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that before I went to law school? But anyway, so, yeah, um, that was that's my law school story. So, yeah, I think most people, they practice law for 20, 25 years, and then they figure out they're miserable. I figured that out in two weeks. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how perceptive I am. And qu so quitting is okay. You got sometimes. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know if you should make a practice of quitting, but I, back then, I'll tell you something. For an Asian American to quit law school, you know, 2002, my family was, you know, picking rice and and harvesting rice and picking sugar cane and, you know, doing all that so that I get to law school. And what do I do? I quit after two weeks. I mean, you know, my entire family tree is now scarred. Um but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you should quit everything you try, but sometimes it's it's it takes more courage to quit than to stick it out. Yep, I agree. And you talk <laughs> about luck, guy. You know, luck and and um, obviously with the story with yourself and how it changed my life and and uh, created the unicorn, right? Uh, you you did it for me, so literally. So talk about luck and how important luck is. Uh, yeah, I, 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 as I get older and older, I, I have come to believe that it's better to be lucky than smart. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if, you know, if somehow you had an artificial choice, if God says to you, you can be lucky, you can be smart, son, pick lucky. Um, I will say, though, that there is a more actionable lesson here, which is I think people who default to yes 
get more lucky. And by that, I mean, um, you should always be thinking how you can say yes, what you can do for people, even without the expectation of being paid back. Uh, because, well, for one thing, it, it seems to me that often you do get paid back. And even if you don't get paid back directly, I think that there is a karmic scoreboard in the sky. And what you do for people is racking up points. Now, that may seem shallow and, you know, it doesn't really work like that. But, you know, who knows for sure? So why take a chance with something like that? So, you know, like, like when you asked me to sign the book and take a picture with the guy, I mean, seriously, like what is the big freaking deal? You know, I mean, some of these celebrities where they have like their personal assistant, the personal assistant has a personal assistant. They have a limo driver. They have a guard and they have like, you know, the social media person There's like there's an entourage. Right. And you can't get to the person because I don't know what. And so like, Listen, I, I understand that, um, you know, the request can go on forever. So I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard this story that when Elizabeth Warren was running for president, she stayed in Times Square and signed autographs for like three hours, right? Like right there, I would vote for her just for that. And so uh, I, I, I understand the constraints that, you could spend your whole life signing autographs and taking pictures and doing all that. On the other hand, I mean, seriously, you know, look, this is a high quality problem, right? Like you wake up in the morning and too many people want your autograph. Yeah. Oh my God. Holy shit, man. My life is ruined. Too many people want my autograph. And so, you know, sometimes when you see these athletes and these celebrities and, you know, they have their people's people and they're protected and they can't do all that. It's like, you know, you're like, you're one knee injury away from being nothing. And mm -hmm. you are one bad film away from being nothing. And, you know, you're one drunken DUI away from being nothing. So, you know, give it a rest, man. If, yeah, I, Listen, if, if the day comes where nobody asks me for my autograph, I'd be freaking depressed, man. <laughs> I don't know about you. So. <laughs> we don't have that problem too much yet, but hopefully we get there. You know, we get there. <laughs> <laughs> inspiration of people like you. Guy, you said, you know, you talk about, um, I remember you did this when we had the conversation over in Russia. You talked about uh, leaving Apple and then coming back yeah. to Apple. And you said the grass is not always greener on the other side. And you also yeah. mentioned Yahoo. I remember you talked about that. I didn't see that in the book, but I remember you talking about that. Can you talk about in terms of uh, the grass is not always greener on the other side? Because I love that, actually. Well, so... Uh, if you look at my checkered past, I quit Apple in, let's see, 87, and I quit Apple in 97. Uh, and then I think Steve Jobs offered me another position in 2000. So I I turned down, I quit Apple and turned down Apple, Apple once. So it's like three times, right? Because every time I thought, I left Apple the first time to start a software company. I left Apple the second time to start a, a, an investment bank. You know, I turned down Steve the third time because I don't know what. You know, I thought Apple was doomed. And so you it's very tricky to time your exits perfectly. And now I am just one data point, right? But I would say that if I had stayed at Apple the first time, stayed at Apple the second time, or accepted Steve Jobs offer the third time, I would not be on this call right now because i would be my people's people would be reviewing your proposal for me to come on so so uh you know sometimes i mean if you're absolutely miserable okay i understand that but uh you know sometimes you just it's it's the long haul um you know that the, the, statistically, I don't know, 90, 95% of startups fail, right? Now, don't get me wrong. You could go to the next Apple or Google um, or Facebook or Pinterest or whatever, but the odds are not good. 
And this is one of the dangers of listening to businessmen talk and reading their books is because it's, it's not scientific. It's all story based. And listen, I'm a big believer in stories, right? But, you know, if you look at management books, I can prove almost any theory you want, right? So there's a book that says you have to pivot. There's also a book that says you have to stick it out. When people tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, you can't get investors, you stick it out and you believe. All right, so those are two completely contradictory pieces of information. Exactly. Which one do you do? Mm -hmm. Do you stick it out or do you quit Apple to start the next big thing? Huh. Not so clear. And, and that's the problem with management and, you know, business gurus is that it's all sort of allegorical. There, there, there's very little science there. Well, you talk about shades of gray and you talk about your uncle going into a store with some screws. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about shades of gray, right? I love yes. that. <laughs> this is another pivotal moment. So my, my favorite uncle, uh, I don't know, once we went to this discount store, hardware store, and he needed two screws. And so we go in this store, and he opens up one of the little, you know, bottles that has screws. And he doesn't buy the packet of 20 screws. He took two screws out. I mean, he shoplifted two screws. I had never seen anything like that. You know, I was like totally brought up. You got to be honest. You don't steal. You don't cheat. You know, you don't whatever. Right. And here's my uncle, my favorite uncle. He's stealing screws from the hardware store. Like, wow. I mean, this, you know, so one thing is, you know, life is not black and white, obviously, because my favorite uncle, who was a straight up kind of guy, stole two screws. I just, I, now when I go to Osh, I, every time I go to Osh, which is now, it used to be Orchard Supply. Now it's Outdoor Supply Hardware. Every time I go to Osh, I think about that story. And I like, I will never take my children into Osh and steal two screws because it scarred me. And he's the one that took you to the movies and everything else. Yeah, movies, the zoo, you know, all the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then you talk, you know, you talk about map and Pink's map and mastery. Um, I mean, can autonomy you talk about and purpose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. autonomy and purpose? Yeah. Okay. So I, you said you let's, in one of your interviews. Let's, let's just let's just give uh, Daniel Pink credit for this because it's his concept, not mine. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have to know what to steal. It, there's a certain skill in knowing what to steal, and so Daniel Pink has this concept called MAP. M A P. So it's mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And this is an acronym to explain how to attract and keep great people. So. The, the concept is that you enable people to master new skills working for you while they are working autonomously mm -hmm. towards a higher purpose than simply making money. And if you offer people a map, you can get better people and get them to stay. That's fantastic. And you also say that, you know, that changing your mind is a sign of intelligence, intelligence. and confidence, yes. right? And yeah. Uh, so, I mean, some people, oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't change my mind, but that's kind of like a pivot, isn't it? Sometimes. Well, and, yeah, the, the example I cite is that when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, I think it was in 2007, uh, when he introduced the iPhone, you know, the iPhone was a closed system. You could not write apps for an iPhone. You could do Safari plugins, but that was it. And a year later, Steve and Apple completely reversed. Now it was wide open. You could develop apps. And if, if they had kept it a closed system to, quote, unquote, keep it secure and private, uh, iPhone would have failed. And so that's a 180 degree reversal. And I think that that is a very, very good example. I mean, that's why Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs, um, because, well, OK, so a, a good entrepreneur would have the courage and intelligence to change his or her mind. What made Steve Jobs the next cut above was that both times he convinced you that he was right. Mm -hmm. So when he had a closed iPhone, you thought, oh, yeah, of course it's a closed iPhone. And a year later, when he opens it up, you say, of course it's an open iPhone. <laughs> That's what separates Steve Jobs from most people. And then you also said in there that, that there, was a, um, there was a time you were in the office 
and that you were talking about this <laughs> differently. <laughs> I mean, that take, I got to tell you, that takes guts, right? That really takes guts. So, wait, uh, is this a story when he asked me what I thought of the company? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, man, I'm going to cover so many stories. You won't have to buy the book. But actually, I'd rather people listen to my podcast than buy the book. Really, really good. Really, really good. <laughs> No, but what you should really do, you should really do is listen to my podcast because it has remarkable people like Jane Goodall, Margaret Atwood, Christy Yamaguchi, Steven Pinker, Steven Wolfram. Uh, anyway, so I'm when in my cube. Podcast, guy, when is, it, when is it on so the audience will know? Well, no, my podcast, uh, obviously, you can subscribe to it at Apple Podcasts yeah. and, and, you know, Stitcher and Simplecast and wherever. Um, but uh, every Wednesday morning at 6.30 Pacific, we release one. So tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, we are releasing a guy named Randy Nonenberg. And if you're a car person, I guarantee you, you are familiar with a website called Bring a Trailer for collectible cars. So mm -hmm. he's the creator of Bring a Trailer. It's very, if you're a car guy or car gal, uh, mm -hmm. you will not want to. Yeah, I just... I just got a notice that a 1976 Porsche 911 Carrera Targa is now live at Bring a Trailer. Anyway, um, <laughs> wait, now what was the question, Chef? <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about. Um, oh, oh, when Steve Jobs showed up in my cubicle. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve Jobs shows up in my cubicle with someone I never met before. And he says to me, what do you think of this company called Nowhere, guy? And it was an educational software company. I said, well, mediocre company, mediocre product, drilling practice, two plus two equals five or four. <laughs> um, you know, it's not very strategic. doesn't really take advantage of Macintosh user interface, Macintosh graphics, Macintosh anything. So, you know, it's like not strategic, Steve. And then he says, I want you to meet the CEO of Nowhere. <laughs> so that's what it was like working for Steve Jobs. And then... You also said you were in a meeting with Steve Jobs, and yeah, he, and you had a little <laughs> confrontation with him. <laughs> yeah, this is that th that uh, this story may have cost me, I don't know, two hundred million bucks. But anyway, so uh, at the end of my second stint at Apple, when I was an Apple Fellow and Chief Evangelist, uh, Steve was. Uh, Steve was on his way back to Apple, you know, selling next to Apple. And you know, now, now he's part of the company sort of again. And we have this meeting with all the marketing people and uh, a guy from Shiat Day, the, the advertising agency. So the guy shows the think different campaign, you know, with Gandhi and Edison and, you know, Muhammad Ali about how, how great leaders thought differently. So he shows us this video, the, the ad agency guy shows us this video and we just love this. You know, it's like everything that Apple stands for thinking different, being different, being bold, blah, blah, blah. At the end of this meeting, the shy day guy says to Steve, I have two copies of the videos. I'll give you one, uh, Steve, and I'll give one to Guy. And Steve says, this is in front of 30 people, don't give one to Guy. <laughs> so, so I say, Steve, is it because you don't trust me? And he says, yes, Guy, I don't trust you. And I said, Steve, that's okay. I don't trust you either. <laughs> so, now, was that worth 250 million bucks? Not clear. Would but you do it again? <laughs> probably. Probably. I got you, know you. What? you know what? Knowing Steve Jobs, that probably made me go higher in his book, not lower. <laughs> he liked the confrontation like that, huh? <laughs> I, 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 I can't be certain of that. <laughs> God, you talk, you know, there's an amazing story that you have, too. And it's just uh, talk about being humble. You talk about when you're in Moscow with Richard Branson and you talk about, uh, <laughs> And just unbelievable. Yeah. So, could you re tell that story? Yeah. So, th this is not about my humility. This is about Richard Branson's humility. So, Richard Branson and I uh, were in Moscow uh, for a conference, same same conference. And I'm in the speaker ready room, and he comes in, 
And he says to me, Guy, do you fly Virgin? I said, well, you know, Richard, I'm United Airlines Global Services. I don't know how I got to be Global Service. I sure as hell don't want to jeopardize being United Airlines Global Service. So for those of you who are not United Airlines Global Service, Global Service is the highest tier. And it's like black magic how you get to be Global Service. And when you're Global Service, you get upgrades faster and easier. And you know, when your flight is delayed, they call you and tell you where they put you on the next flight. And you know, I think the world just completely changes if you're United Airlines Global Service. So anyway, as I say this, Richard Branson gets down on his knees and he starts polishing my shoes with his jacket. And so that's the moment I started flying Virgin America. Sir Richard Branson is polishing his Sir shoes. Richard Branson, yeah. Oh, yeah that's kite, kite surfer with Barack Obama got on his knees. Guy, you know, when, when we met, you were doing ice hockey, and I understand that you've gotten yeah. away from that now, and you're doing – are you still doing surfing, or what, what's happening? Yes, I, uh, I, I took up ice hockey for my two older boys, and then my daughter fell in love with surfing. And so I tried surfing, and I love surfing. So uh, I started surfing at about 60 or 61. Now I'm 66, so I've been surfing about five years. Let's just say that starting surfing at 61 is not ideal, although I started hockey at 44, so I am a late bloomer, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, now um, I, I live a block from the beach, and I go surfing twice a day, and what I did prior to this was surf. I came in from surfing and did this interview. So wow. I love surfing. You're in Santa Cruz, right? Yes. Wow. Yes. Great. You know, so word to wisdom. You know, these are, uh, they've been trying times over the last six or seven months. And my audience, by the way, is startups from all over the world and yeah. venture capitalists and, and entrepreneurs. What are the words of wisdom you would give them right now uh, during these uh, trying times? They're starting a business and they're looking at going global. Well, to the entrepreneurs, I would say that, you know, it is all about, um, creating customers it's not about raising money i think a lot of entrepreneurs they think that you know their whole goal in life is to raise money actually when you raise money that's when it really starts getting hard but uh, i would say that the the object of a company is to create customers just as the object of a podcast is to create listeners and uh, so what that means is you have to focus on the prototype not on raising money and that is a huge you know, leap for many people. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, and I would say that now if you're already in operation uh, in this pandemic, I think that there are several things. First of all, cash is king. So you know, take all the inventory and stuff you're sitting on and dump it, turning it into cash. Because at the end of the day, at the end of this pandemic, you know, you're either dead or you're alive. It's not whether you preserve your brand and lawful positioning. I mean, you know, Neiman Marcus is in bankruptcy. It's not about preserving the aura of prestige of Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus is either going to be there or not there. So if you're Neiman Marcus and you need to dump all the mink stoles, I would suggest you dump them as opposed to, you know, being worried about competing with um, – coat rack or whatever the other you know so so that's number one is cash is king queen prince and princess uh, number two is i think that now uh you should simplify your product lines because people's expectations are very different it used to be that you expected to get every size every color every configuration uh, me as a consumer i am just so freaking happy when i get anything close to what i ordered you know like I go to the market and I say, okay, you know, I really want 16 ounce Jif Creamy, but they only have 32 ounce Skippy Super Chunky. Hey, I'll take the Super Chunky. It's okay, you know. So that's, uh, you know, simplify your product line. Simplifying your product line also has the impact of simplifying your supply chain, which has got to be a good thing because, yeah. you know, you can't depend on this boat coming from China. For one thing, we have a trade war with China. Someday we may have a physical war with China. And so, you know, maybe you should have some sources in Vietnam and Korea. I mean, so there's that kind of thing. And I also think that now 
you have to start doing business direct, direct with your customer. Because in a pandemic, if Jeff Bezos decides that your socks or your you know ceramic mug or your I don't know whatever is not quote as quote essential, guess what? <laughs> I mean, so so now is the time to do business direct. And also, if you're selling not just through Amazon, but you know brick and mortar retailers. Well, brick and mortar retailers, they, they might not exist. If they do exist, they're letting 10 people at a time in the store. They're not exactly loading up on inventory. So I think all of these factors point to you should start be start doing business directly with your customer as opposed to going through a multiple tier distribution. And you might say, well, you know, what happens if my retailers get pissed off or my distributors get pissed off? Well, I would be more worried about you dying as a company than pissed off retailers because, mm. like, for one thing, the retailer might not survive. Or wouldn't that be the irony, right? So you're trying to preserve your retail distribution and then your retailers die. So what did you just accomplish? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you killed yourself too. So I think it's now time to do business direct. Do business direct. Guy, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You're an amazing person, and uh, yeah, I you're too kind. appreciate the, the help that you've given. Um, thank you to my audience, and uh, look forward to our next uh, event. Thank you, Guy, for your time. Well, okay, I just, all of you out there, just trust me when I tell you this. If you want to be a better entrepreneur, you really should go look at my podcast. And I'll tell you some episodes in particular. So I interviewed Steve Wozniak, obviously co-founder of Apple. I interviewed David Ocker, who's the really the godfather of branding. I interviewed Bob Cialdini. He is the godfather of influence and persuasion. Stephen Wolfram, who created Mathematica. Uh, there are some great, Martha Stewart, there are some great entrepreneurs. I guarantee you, you will learn about entrepreneurship by subscribing to my podcast. Subscribe to Guy's podcast and you'll <laughs> learn a lot. Thanks, Guy, for your time today. Thank we you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.